The Pest and Predator podcast is brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm. Welcome to the Pest and Predator podcast. I'm your host, Sean Haney, founder of realagriculture.com. Season four of the Pest and Predators podcast. It is brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm. We have three guests today on the Pest and Predator podcast. Up first, we have Dr. Megan Venkoski with AFC in Saskatoon. We've got Dr. James Tanzi with the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture. And Dr. John Gevslowski, who's with Manitoba Agriculture, Food, and Rural Development. Welcome to all three of you, wily veterans of the Pest and Predator podcast. Let's. Uh, this is interesting. Invasive species. This is uh, going to be an interesting conversation. I guess, I guess Megan, let's start off with you. Um, wh- what is an invasive species? What exactly are we talking about here? So we're talking about any species, insect, plant, animal, otherwise, that is not natural to an area, that is coming into Canada, for example, from the United States or from a country in Europe or Australia. It's anything that isn't normally present here where where we are and and it's something invasive species are a huge issue that we're seeing become a larger and larger issue with time um, because of trade between countries because of climate change and changing weather conditions that are permitting more species to survive in places where they normally wouldn't Um, And they're a huge problem potentially for farmers, but also for local biodiversity because these species get here and they tend to compete very, very well with the native species, with the natural species that we have. And so they cause problems in terms of that biodiversity, but also a lot of issues for our farmers. It's kind of like somebody taking koi and putting them in the lake. Exactly. And and with the insect world, we're talking about invasions of things like Japanese beetle, um, which is a big problem in eastern Canada and is a potential problem in Vancouver area in BC, where they're running an eradication program. It's all kinds of different species that could be coming in either intentionally or accidentally introduced or brought in with trade goods, um, spotted lanternfly hitches rides on vehicles that are coming into Canada from the the United States where it's already present. It's invasive to the United States too. So it's, yeah, there's all kinds of different insects, especially that we're concerned about, but other things too, uh, weeds and, and other plants. For sure. Well, you, uh, you go on a tour and it's like, oh yeah, that was brought here by the Europeans, right? We, we're still blaming them for stuff. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Jim, w- w- let, let's talk about these priority invasive and migratory insect posters. W- w- what are these? Uh, well, these, uh, they're, they're, a, they're a compendium of uh, uh, species that are of primary concern in different regions of uh, different regions of the country. So um, there's a uh, uh, we've got representation from British Columbia, from the prairies, from Ontario and the Maritimes, uh, or Ontario, Quebec and the Maritimes. Um, so these are pests that would be important primarily to agriculture and forestry, but some of these can be nuisance pests uh, as well, uh, and uh, with a high likely likelihood of being detected and or established in those areas and cause either economic concerns or, or you know, uh, uh, issues with, uh, with uh, uh, forestry or agriculture or, uh, or recreation um, broadly of concern in those regions. So uh, Megan, you know, Megan mentioned, uh, you know, spotted lanternfly, uh, which is a, is, is a worry across the country. Uh, it, you know, uh, some of the work to, indicates that uh, uh, it's likely to become established more prevalently in different parts of the country, but it's worth keeping an eye out for. So, John, are we trying to prevent invasive species or are we trying to educate because it's not a matter of if, it's, it's when in some cases? I think we're trying to do both, really. Uh, we're hoping that through education, we can maybe prevent or at least um, reduce the risk of certain species arriving. There's education campaigns on for quite a few of these. Uh, one that... Uh, I guess, uh, or has gotten a lot of media attention, 
is the emerald ash borer uh, for the ash trees. Uh, there's been nationwide campaigns trying to drill the message into people, do not move firewood across the country, especially ash firewood. So you see signs up along the highways here in the prairies uh, warning people about that, the intention there. Now we do have a very localized population of Winnipeg for that insect, but it's very localized. The intention there is to prevent things from spreading uh, using education. Now with our poster project, um, so we've got a poster, Jim talked about it, it's got 12 um, different species on it. The idea with this is we want to make people aware of some of these uh, potential risks. Um, should they start showing up here, uh, we have a better chance of eradication if we catch things early. Uh, often once the cat's out of the bag, you can't get it back in. So the, the idea is to try to catch things early after they've arrived. The more people that know about them and possibly are out looking for them, the better. So with the poster series, uh, really anybody who's uh, uh, um, looking for insects as a hobby, whether it's a, a light in the backyard or out there doing sweeping, ag agronomists that do uh, crop scouting for a career, if they know about these things and they see them and they alert us right away, then we do have a better chance of eradicating a population, should that be possible. And it's not trying to reduce the spread. John, you, yeah. talk, you talked about insect watching like it was bird watching. Is, is this a thing? We, we, we need to like sort of divert here. Are, are there hobbyists out there that are looking for insects? How do you know that that's not a thing? <laughs> okay, that's fair. I'm, I'm being how do you not know that it, How do you not know that, that it's a thing? <laughs> I love it. Okay. Um, and, and you mentioned cat out of the bag, right? This yeah. is, you know, it's hard to put the genie back in the bottle. In, in some of these cases, because we can use all the metaphors we want, um, be, because there can be aggression in the spread and the, you know, the, 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 um, the, the increase in the population. Um, this can be really hard to turn course. We need to be preventative, I guess, is the, is, is the yeah. best way to put it. So um, for, for the group, what are some species that we are watching for in, in the prairie region then? So if, if I could just just address your previous point, I think yeah. I think um, there there are, there are different phases to either you know, how to address an invasive species, and if you can catch them early, as John mentioned uh, mentioned initially, um, then you have the opportunity to eradicate. You have the oppor opportunity to take the opportunity uh, to take the opportunity for that species to become established. Once it does become established, then you're left with mitigation and containment. And failing that, then 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 it just becomes population control. So rather than being obliged to engage in population control, uh, obviously eradication is uh, is uh, is the best way to go. And early detection is is tremendously important to that. More eyes that we can get out there looking for these animals, and and some of these animals are very conspicuous. Uh, so they they will be noticed by people. And if they you know if they can call you know, uh, representatives of, 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 of different jurisdictions and, you know, get, uh, get trained eyes on these things, then, then we can, uh, we can address them as need be. Okay. So Jim, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll switch questions. I'll ask you this. What's the enemy release hypothesis? Oh, uh, it's, it's one of the, one of the, uh, uh, one of the proposed reasons for why invasive species become invasive. Uh, so if we, in, in, uh, um, in, an, in an animal's native habitat, it's good, or, you know, an organism's native habitat, it's going to co-evolve with a number of natural enemies. And that's been the focus of a lot of what we've talked about uh, with, uh, with this program and, and with other programs, and not, you know, not least of which uh, the, uh, the Field Heroes program. Uh, but um, uh, when they co-evolve with those natural enemies, the natural enemies have a regulating effect on their populations. Without those natural enemies, then the regulation of those populations is eliminated, and they can increase increase dramatically and become, as Meg, Megan mentioned, you know, pretty sub, pretty substantial competitors in uh, in uh, in uh, different niches, different communities, and uh, and uh, can become uh, highly economically problematic in in some cases as well. Okay, so let's. So, oh, go ahead, Megan. 
Sorry, to, to build on that, two examples of invasive species that we already deal with across the prairies in terms of agriculture are the pea leaf weevil and the cabbage seed pod weevil. They're both invasive to Canada from different parts of the world and don't have natural enemies present in Canada, except for maybe some generalist species like crabid beetles that will eat anything that they come across. And so that's, again, part of the reason why we're dealing with cabbage seed pod weevil and pea leaf weevil as pests is because they, they escaped that natural control from any parasitoids, fungal pathogens, um, other predators that were evolved to eat them because those species didn't come along with them when they invaded. Sometimes, on occasion, some parasitoids do come along with those invasive species, but it's pretty, pretty rare cases and not, and the parasitoids for those beneficial insects don't always have the same opportunity to become established as the pests do. So again, that's, again, I guess, if we think of the, the pea leaf weevil story and the cabbage seed pod weevil story, we've seen both of those populations really expand in, in terms of size and range from their initial areas of detection on the prairies in southern Alberta all the way now to southern Manitoba and quite far north as well. So again, the earlier that we can, can catch them, the better. And uh, again, this, this project was really to help us keep our eyes out for some of these species that are kind of getting to the point where they're knocking on our doors. So an invasive species is invading. Can in, 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 yep. in, I think of like causing a detriment. So damage of some sort, whatever you know, that looks like. Could invasive species end up being a beneficial? Is there a po like is there positive examples out there where we're like, oh, thank goodness this showed up? Yeah, hooray for rats! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, actually, um, yeah. things are brought over because they're beneficial. So just yeah. the the opposite. Uh, there are many examples of intentional releases right. of beneficials. Now, if done properly, it can work really well. Um, there have been examples of things that were released maybe a bit prematurely before we knew a lot about them and tended to affect things other than the pest, so not so good. But we've got some good examples of more, I guess, modern releases. Um, cereal leaf beetle is a really good example. There's a, a yep. parasitic wasp called Tetrastichus julis, just a tiny little mm. black wasp. And cereal leaf beetle, it's been around for decades, um, but it's a more recent invader into the Canadian prairies. Um, when it started spreading across the prairies, uh, this wasp, Tetrastichus julis, was brought in. And they had a colony that they were rearing in Lethbridge. And people like me in Manitoba, when we first got cereal leaf beetle here, um, year one, we brought in that wasp, we did some releases, and we kept on doing that for a few years afterwards. Now, we have cereal leaf beetle here, but people aren't spraying for it. It never really did get the chance to become a highly economical pest. And I attribute that to the wasp um, getting established early in the game and doing actually a very good job keeping it contained. Um, a couple of years ago, I was taking some samples and sending them in to have the larva dissected just to see how many were parasitized by this wasp. And there were fields where it would be 30, 40, 50% of the larva that had paras parasites in them. So uh, we do at times bring things in, release them purposely because they're good guys and we want them. Okay. Yeah, so if I could, go, oh, go ahead, ahead No, go ahead, Jim. Oh, no, I, I was just going to say this. This is, uh, is The concept is called classical biological control. So there, there are different types of biological control where you – uh, do scouting in, a, in an organism's native range and you find natural enemies of those animals, do the evaluation of these uh, or, or of these organisms, do the evaluation of these organisms uh, to determine that they have a limited host range. So they're not going to attack uh, um, the, uh, the, the, the invasive in, in, uh, in, in the range where you want to control them, it, that they're not going to attack a, uh, organisms other than those. Uh, then those will be screened. Oftentimes that screening takes up to upwards of 10 years. Uh, to determine the host specificity. These will be brought to, let's say, you know, North America in this case, uh, and released uh, uh, in the hopes that they become established on their, on their target hosts and propagate themselves. So th this is classical biological control. There are, there's also inundative biological control where large numbers of biocontrol agents 
can be introduced. And there, and there are success stories uh, based on that as well. Um, I, I wanted to add too that there's also the possibility for for um, native natural enemies to cross over to some invasive species. And there's some speculation that we may be, we, we may see, be seeing that in cabbage seed pod weevil. Mm. So there's a small complex of parasitoids that actually attacks cabbage seed pod weevil larvae. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a little uncertain as to whether they were brought over with the cabbage seed pod weevil and accidentally released with the accident, accidental uh, release of one of the two primary releases of cabbage seed pod weevil. Uh, but they are established in North America, and they're having, uh, although an increase increasing effect uh, on the uh, on the cabbage seed pod weevil, the, the effect still remains relatively small. <clears throat> Pardon me, uh, but but yeah, they they are here. What further complicates this is that uh, you introduce chemical control of let's say cabbage seed pod weevil, and in the case of the parasitoids, the timing of this matches really well with the timing of when the cabbage seed pod weevil is moving into canola fields and when the recommendation for insecticide applications. So uh, the insecticide application would work contrary to the classical biological control and uh, and you wouldn't get the effect of these natural enemies that you might normally. So I got a lot, little off into the weeds there. Also, another really good example is weed biocontrol. Ah, right. <laughs> yep. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk about what are some of the species that we are watching for in the prairie region? Who wants to jump up and tackle that? Well, I can go ahead and, and start with one. It's actually not on our poster, but it's Swede midge. And so this is an invasive species from Europe that we have in Eastern Canada, but that we do not have on the prairies. And every year we are monitoring for it with a series of pheromone traps. Volunteers very kindly host these traps in their field. And, and that is our, our, our effort to have an early detection program for Swede midge on the prairies because it's a devastating canola pest. We don't want it here. And so this is one thing that we're, we're doing for Swede midge, but it's tiny and really difficult to find. So it didn't make the cut for our poster project because for the posters, we wanted to really focus on insects that were bright and colorful and large and were really distinctive and, and things that amateurs or hobbyists or farmers or, or anyone out in nature could potentially find and, and observe. So, so it's not on the poster, but it is one. Um, one that is on the poster that, um, that we don't have in the prairie region is the Japanese beetle. Uh, so this is a species that, like I said earlier, it's quite well established in eastern Canada. It tends to be a pest of um, flowers and, and fruit trees, and it tends to it's a generalist, it has lots of different plant hosts, so it could have economic impacts on crops, but also on uh, fruit trees and, and um, plants that people are planting in their yards and gardens and, and things like that. Um, it's, so it, it is concerning. It's, it's a very shiny, um, purpley colored beetle. So it's one that is pretty easy to see. It's got some distinctive dots on it. Um, yeah, bright and colorful and shiny and easy easy to notice um, if you're if you're out and about. So. Yeah, it's quite a handsome it's quite a handsome beetle actually. Yeah. <laughs> quite, I was going to ask you what 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 are the characteristics that qualify for that description? But uh, I will not take the bait on that, Jim. What what are some of the do you, do you have uh, something you want to mention? Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a couple. I'll talk about a couple of uh, relatively closely related ones. Uh, one is yellow spotted sink bug. Uh, this is originally of North African origin. It's found its way. It's invasive in Europe now. It's invasive in North America uh, and in Asia. So it seems to be working its way through Japanese agriculture and through North American and and through European uh, European and, and other Asian sites as well. Um, it has not yet been determined to be established in Canada, although there have been a couple of intercepts. Uh, and it sounds like these were at points of entry in the in the country. It has a broad host range, so about 60 host plants. Uh, it's a large, conspicuous insect, uh, so it shouldn't be too difficult to see. And it doesn't look very much uh, like uh, uh, many of our uh, native stink bugs. So it's it's really quite conspicuous. Uh, you know, relatively dark background with yellow splotches all over it and yellow stripes on its uh, on uh, on its uh, on its hemilytra. So it's it's really uh, it's really uh, quite a quite a showy little animal. Uh, well, you know, large, large by insect standards, uh, large-ish. 
Um, but one of the primary concerns with this one is its broad host range. So it will feed on poplar trees. It will feed on salix, so willows. It'll feed on a number of different fruit trees. It's, it's been documented as uh, feeding on, uh, on reef seeds. So that is uh, canola. Mm. Uh, in China, so it's uh, you know its potential to become a significant pest is certainly there. Um, you know, are the are the climate conditions you know amicable for its establishment? Uh, probably not in large parts of the country, but with a warming climate, uh, you know, I think uh, that's always the worry. Is you know, does the is this going to allow for range expansion and uh, an establishment? The other one I was I was thinking about was uh, brown marmorated stink bug, real broad host range. Um, also a relatively large conspicuous insect, although it can be mistaken for some, for some natives, but real broad host range, 300, 300 plus plant species it'll feed on, including uh, uh, a number of different field crops and fruit crops and, uh, and, uh, and et cetera, ornamentals as well. Uh, so we're definitely keeping an eye out for, for both of these animals. Okay, that's the, I don't like the sounds of those ones. Okay, John, what about you? So yeah, I'll give you a couple examples of my favorite invasive insects. Um, so, so far we've been talking a lot about insects that came over from um, other countries and uh, established in North America, and we're kind of watching for them in the prairies. There's examples though of insects that are actually native to North America that have just gone through some really wild range expansions that we're watching for. Mm. And an example of this is something called Western Bean Cutworm. And it's now, uh, corn is, uh, beans, sorry, are one of their host dry beans. Corn is another thing that they will feed on. And prior to about 2000, they were considered a pest of corn and dry beans in the Western part of the US Corn Belt and some of the Rocky Mountain states. but Further east, not really a concern. Then after 2000, they started this really wild range expansion, really rapid range expansion, where they moved into the eastern part of the Corn Belt, into Ontario, into Quebec. They're a major pest of corn in Ontario now. Um, they have been found in the southern parts of Minnesota and North Dakota. Uh, we did have some pheromone beta traps up, them, up for them in Manitoba. In previous years, we've never found any. So as far as we know, we don't have them in the Canadian prairies yet, but it's something we're keeping an eye out for. Um, so we're encouraging people, and this is why we have this in the poster, we're encouraging people, if you see something in the ears of the corn that is not a corn borer and not a corn earworm, and a caterpillar that has a couple rectangular dark plates in behind the head, um, let us know. Uh, it, again, if we do um, have a population that's established somewhere, uh, it'd be good to know early. Why it started this rapid range expansion, it's been debated. There's all kinds of hypotheses. I don't know if we really know. Um, in around 2000, we started using BT corn varieties. Um, maybe uh, some of the things that would otherwise compete with Western bean cutworm um, such as corn borer and corn earworm, um, were being controlled by the BT corn and Western bean cutworm wasn't. So uh, kind of a um, replacement happening. Um, more zero till was being used uh, in the last couple of decades. And of course, there's climate change. So maybe one, maybe a combination of some of these factors. Uh, the other one that I will throw in uh, is uh, an insect pest, potential insect pest of canola called pollen beetle. And just like the name would suggest, they feed on pollen. And the adult beetles will be active around the time the canola is flowering. They will be up on the buds and flowers laying their eggs. The larva will be feeding in the buds and flowers, mainly on the pollen. End result is you get these, um, we call it bud blasting, where you just you don't get a bud, you have a little stub instead, uh, or, or you, so you can lose the bud or the flower. Um, the, the pollen beetles aren't much bigger than a flea beetle. And to see them on the plant, they may al almost look like a flea beetle, but they've got clubbed antenna. And they don't jump like flea beetles. They don't have the big, um, thick back femurs. They don't jump 
like a flea beetle. But if you see little black beetles on the canola that, that have clubbed antenna, uh, again, send us samples, let us know. Uh, we have been doing uh, pr provincial surveys in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and um, Alberta. We've been doing surveys for this insect for several years. We, we go out and sweep canola uh, in the flower stage. We've not found them yet, but we're continuing to look. And they have been established quite well in Atlantic Canada and uh, I believe in Quebec as well. So th are there any additional invasive species that we want to, that are of concern in other parts of Canada we want to mention? Mm. Um, I'll throw spotted lanternfly into that mix, which is probably going to be a bigger concern in, say, Ontario than it will the Canadian prairies. So spotted lanternfly, it belongs to a group of insects called plant hoppers, and they're, they're sucking insects. They feed on the sap of uh, plants. Um, and uh, Jim talked about insects being handsome and Spotted lanternfly, I don't know if you can see it in the poster here, but it's up near the top here. Quite colorful insect. Mm. Uh, so easy to uh, identify if they should start showing up. Um, so uh, spotted lanternfly, it was first found in Pennsylvania in 2014 in North America. They're from Southeast Asia. Uh, started to expand its range, and it's right across the border from Ontario now, uh, Buffalo area. Um, Tree of Heaven is one of their preferred adult food plants, uh, which we don't have in the prairies. Uh, Ontario, Quebec, and BC do, but they will, the, especially the, the juveniles, the nymphs, they feed on lots of host plants, including grapes and a lot of fruit trees, which makes them a big concern for people in, um, in any area that grows grapes and, and fruit in Canada. So that's one that is currently being watched for it and has gotten a bit of media attention uh, in recent years. There's actually a task force um, led by the CFIA, I believe, to uh, monitor and, and watch for spotted lanternfly. And we've been doing some, or they've been doing some preemptive research. And Dr. Amanda Rowe with the Canadian Forest Service has found that this species can actually tolerate quite cold conditions, colder than we would have thought. So it's possible that it could be a problem for the prairies um, because of that, that cold tolerance that has been quite unexpected. So that is, it, it's one that, like John says, it's showy, it is getting a lot of media attention, and it is, yeah, just across the border from parts of Ontario now. So that's that's a really big one, I think, on the list. Okay. Any others? Oh, there's there's several. I think I think yeah, I I don't know that you can talk about invasive species without mentioning northern giant hornet. Uh, of course, that one gets that one gets a lot of press. Um, I guess colloquially called the murder hornet. Oh, I remember uh, that being on the news. Yeah. That is yeah, yeah. scary <laughs> stuff, Jim. Not to be confused with the extortion hornet, of course, or the petty, petty larceny hornet, or any of the other criminal activity hornets. Um, so yeah, murder hornet, not not the accepted common name. Uh, it's northern giant hornet. Uh, of course, the, yeah, this 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 one uh, it has been detected in established populations in the northwest United States. And uh, and uh, in BC, although I think it's been a little while since we've seen an established population, uh, so CFIA and uh, and the province of, uh, of British Columbia uh, teamed up on uh, on an eradication and detection program for that one, and, and it looks like the uh, monitoring continues. Uh, this is obviously one we don't want to become established. Uh, can be a pretty dangerous animal and and a potential problem for uh, for beekeepers. So, um, yep the uh, the uh, the murdery murder hornet. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add in to what Jim said that we do have a lot of big uh, things that look somewhat hornet-like in uh, the Canadian prairies. So just as a precaution, if you see a rather large uh, black, white, and yellow thing, it's not a guarantee that it's murder hornet. Um, uh, I've had numerous people send me pictures of uh, a type of insect called horntails, that can be quite large and the females can have a very long egg layer at the back of the body that looks like a ferocious stinger. Um, I think that's the most common misidentification. Um, the last couple of years when the, the overwintered queen yellow jackets were out, I've had people 
uh, claiming they saw murder hornets when they were actually yellow jackets. The, the, the queens are a little larger. Um, we've got a really big wasp, it's an ichneumonid wasp called Megarissa, and it's humongous with a really long egg layer. And that tends to freak people out too, just because of the size. What's really characteristic about that one though, is you, you tend to see them in, in wooded areas uh, and their flight is quite graceful. You know, like you'll, you'll see them do long banking turns with the, with the long ovipositors, ovipositor, pardon me, uh, uh, trailing behind them. Uh, you sort of see where, where fairy myths might come from. Uh, but it's it's really if you see something doing that, uh, it's it's not northern giant hornet. One one report that we get a lot is elm sawfly as well. Yeah. So if you see a large you know a large black and yellow wasp with a really conspicuous yellow dot on its back, that's that's elm sawfly, and 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 the the yellow dot indicates it indicates it's a male. Um, typically, what's seen. Uh, so yeah, in the case yeah, we get a lot of horn tails, a lot of a lot of sawflies. So. Yeah, uh, uh, please uh, maybe photograph live insects before you mash them, and uh, and and send me the send me the picture. Uh, a, it makes them much easier to identify when it's not just you know a windshield smear. And uh, and uh, these these animals can be can actually be beneficial. Right. I mean, especially in the case of horn tails, they're they're real impo important uh, uh, decomposers of uh, of uh, of wood, so or dying wood, dying trees. So Megan. Yeah. <laughs> what what can people do? Like, what's the action item here, or the the call to action in terms of what can people do that are listening to help prevent the establishment or spread of invasive insects? And I think take a picture and ask an entomologist is that that's a good one we learned here. But what, what are some other things people can do? Well, you read my mind because I was actually just going to jump in and say, when when Jim mentioned pictures, I was just going to jump in. So absolutely send us pictures. Um, all of our emails are pretty easy to find anymore. And with camera technology, it's like, if we don't know, we might know someone else who does and we're happy to share them around and, and try to find an answer. Um, with the poster project in particular, all of the posters have QR codes on them that people can scan. And then uh, that takes them to a Google form that we've set up for reporting. So then you can enter information about who you are, where you're at, uh, what you think you've found. And we're adding a feature to those so that if it works, people will be actually able to upload pictures to those forms. And then we would collect that information and again, share it around. Um, a lot of the pests or a lot of the insects that we've talked about today are regulated by the CFIA, not all of them, but a lot of them. And, and as citizens of Canada, it is our, our responsibility when we find something that we think is invasive or that is regulated by the CFIA to actually report those things to the CFIA. And so the, the Google reporting form that we have for this poster project also includes the link so that people can report these sightings to the CFIA directly. But we are partnered with um, colleagues from the CFIA on this project. So if the reports come in to me, then I can share them with uh, Dave Holden and, and others. So those are some of the things, but definitely pictures are great. Send them along to us. There are um, lepidopter societies uh, especially Alberta has a really active uh, lepidopters guild. So this is all about moths and butterflies. So again, people can submit things to them. A lot of our um, regional entomological societies uh, are very willing to have people send pictures to them and, and share those around their membership. I know we get a lot to the Entomological Society of Saskatchewan. So taking pictures and, and sending them to an expert is, is definitely a good choice, um, probably the best. And so the posters that we've been talking about today, uh, John's actually got the prairie poster um, on the Manitoba Agriculture website. Yeah, if you suspect that you have anything on the poster, um, please send a photo. And if you're sending photos, some, sometimes multiple images from different angles is really good. Um, mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. in, the, in the case of, say, uh, Western bean cutworm, um, if I can see the head capsule, I can do a better job with a good ID than if I just get a shot of the back, but the head's kind of curled and I can't see the head cap. So um, sometimes a side shot is good. We can see the, the little fleshy pro legs and things. So 
multiple images from multiple angles will make our jobs doing the ID a lot easier. Great stuff. Yeah. This has been like awesome. Really, really appreciate it. There's some scary stuff out there that uh, <laughs> we need to be preventative about. Uh, really appreciate you guys all joining us for the Peasant Predator podcast. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Pest and Predator podcast. It's brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm.